This module is about artificial reverberation. In another module, we saw how fundamental reverberation is to acoustics and how then, unsurprisingly, human listeners are very sensitive to reverberation. We can go so far as to say that we don't hear sounds without also hearing the spaces in which they happen. And so it is also then no surprise that artists, musicians, and others have attempted to manipulate reverberation, to simulate it, to create artificial reverberation um, as an aspect of their creative process. And so in this module, what we're going to do is talk about different ways that that is accomplished, starting with some historically significant ways that reverb was simulated and proceeding to discuss the most likely ways that we're probably going to simulate reverb um, nowadays using software. So one of the um, earliest methods of simulating reverb using audio technology uh, involves taking a room, a reverberant room, and injecting sound into it and then putting a microphone in that same room and re-recording the sound, re taking the signal from that microphone. And so, you know, basically we're using the real reverberation of the space here, and we're just capturing it. And so often this was done in bathrooms um, because bathrooms are typically have a lot of, they typically have a lot of reflective surfaces in them, which is, I guess, why people like to sing in, sing in the shower and enjoy that reverb. Uh, also, a lot of early studio spaces, the, the bathroom might have been a room that was used somewhat infrequently. Uh, and so, you know, they could put a loudspeaker and microphone apparatus in that room and then uh, use it to, to simulate reverberation. So, you know, the advantages and disadvantages of, of, of this approach um, are something that we can talk about. Um, one advantage of this approach is that it's a very realistic way of simulating a very particular reverb. Um, you, you, you definitely get from this a recording of how that sound would have sounded had it been made in this space originally. Um, disadvantages are obviously that it's a very specific room that you're dealing with. It's also not very portable. Uh, and you also have to be somewhat careful that there aren't other noises in the room because those are obviously going to get picked up. Um, by that microphone as well. So interesting idea and occasionally useful, um, but not especially practical. Um, before moving on, I do want to mention that occasionally you will see artistic projects um, that continue um, the type of design that you see here. Um, for, for example, there was for some time a project in Montreal where uh, a, a huge grain silo was hooked up to the internet in such a way that people could inject sounds into it and then listen back to those sounds um, as they reverberated around this massive grain silo. It was kind of a cool project. So spring and plate reverbs are two more portable um, but still mechanical ways of simulating reverb. Um, these are the spring reverb in particular. The first one we'll talk about is something that you'll still encounter nowadays, often built into guitar amplifiers and things like that. And the basic idea is that you have an input signal and you have some kind of input transducer that turns the input signal into mechanical vibration. And it's connected to a series of pretty tight springs. And at the end of those tight springs is another output transducer that turns the vibration of the springs back into electrical energy. And so you can kind of imagine what happens if we feed a sound signal into the input. The spring at this point starts to vibrate um, with the shape of the sound signal. Um, but then those vibrations go down the spring and they kind of echo and um, repeat back and forth and we get a kind of simulation of, of reverberation. We get a kind of simulation of that um, decay pattern of reverberation. We get a kind of simulation of um, that fact that when sounds reverberate around a space, they, they the energy continues to have a life after its initial moment. Um, and they're also relatively portable. These can be built in, in relatively small boxes and inserted in guitar amplifiers. Um, the disadvantage of this approach is that it's certainly not a very realistic uh, 
simulation of real world reverberation, um, the, the ways that sound moves around a three dimensional space with all kinds of different surfaces in it, that's not very similar to the way that vibrations move through a spring. Um, also, and anyone who's ever used one of the guitar amplifiers that has these spring reverbs in it will know this, um, if you knock the spring reverb or um, make a bump on the floor nearby it, that also goes into your, into your output signal, and so you have to be a little bit careful with it. So somewhat inflexible um, and also somewhat sensitive to other vibrations in the environment. Um, but simple, mechanical, uh, and, and in a way that people have been simulating reverb for a very long time. The plate reverb over here on the right um, is, is sort of the same idea as the spring reverb, um, but addresses one of the limitations of the reverb by adding an extra dimension of vibration. Um, the spring, it's sort of obvious that it's not like a room because it's just a single dimension length um, uh, across which the uh, signal vibrates. Um, the metal plate, the plate reverb, corrects this by instead having a transducer connected somewhere on a big two-dimensional metal plate, an output transducer connected somewhere else on that plate, and now when acoustic energy, you know, electrical energy goes into the transducer, it's translated into mechanical energy, and the vibrations from that mechanical energy are allowed to bounce all around this big metal plate, and we pick up the result of that at the output. So it tends to be somewhat more realistic, uh, somewhat more like the response of um, rooms and things like that. Um, however, the disadvantage of this is that you need a huge metal plate for this to work. Uh, so it's, it's typically not very portable, very, not very expensive, and just like the spring reverb, it is somewhat inflexible and sensitive to other things going on in the environment. But it was common uh, in a certain period for high-end studios and other places where um, creative things were being done with audio for them to have a plate reverb of some kind. So leaving behind the early developments in artificial reverb, we transition now to talking about the two methods with which reverb is commonly simulated in software uh, in our own time. And there are two that we need to keep track of. So the first of the two ways in which reverb is commonly simulated in software is called the Schroeder reverb, or the Schroeder reverberator. And the Schroeder reverberator is basically a network of many, many filters, specifically um, two specialized kinds of filters, comb filters and all-pass filters. But we don't need to worry too much about the details of that right now. Um, this network of filters, the input sound goes into it, and, and an output sound is produced from a mixture of, of what goes that comes out of various of those filters. Um, the network of filters basically simulate the effect of um, the sound being repeated in complicated ways in time. Um, so this is not a direct simula simulation of any physical situation. Uh, so in that sense, it's a little bit like the spring and plate reverb. Um, but unlike the spring and plate reverb, what we have is a complex network of these filters. And so it's kind of having like lots of different um, spring reverbs and plate reverbs all being combined in, um, in carefully tuned ways. Now, one of the advantages of this kind of reverb is that it's computationally very cheap. Um, and what that means is that if we have a complex project with lots of different tracks running simultaneously, all with their own effects, in 2019, it's probably going to be absolutely no problem to have um, as many of these reverb, these Schroeder reverb plugins as we want running um, because they're so computationally cheap. Um, over here on the right, we have uh, a screenshot of Reaper's Reverbate plugin, which is the Schroeder reverb that's built into Reaper. And um, this allows us to talk a little bit about the common parameters of Schroeder reverbs. There's often uh, a, a, a parameter called room size that we can increase uh, and dec or decrease, uh, and which often translates really closely to our perception of the reverb time, how long it takes for the um, artificial reverb to decay when we present it with an input sound. 
And another key parameter is the wet or dry, wet and dry controls. And the dry control basically means it's just a how much of a how much gain is applied to a straight up copy of the input sound. And the wet control is how much gain is applied to the output of that network of filters. So by manipulating the room size or reverb time parameter and the wet and dry parameters, um, we can actually do a reasonably reasonably good job of simulating lots of different um, reverb situations. And so we're well beyond the spring or the plate reverb here. And we have something that we can repeat on many tracks because it's very computationally cheap. But again, it's not a direct simulation of any physical situ situation. Now, you'll find lots of different variations on the Schroeder reverb um, because it, what we're always dealing with is a couple of parameters that control lots of parameters of a network of filters that we don't see. So it's common to see other parameters like damping or dampening um, that typically controls some kind of simulation of the high fre higher frequencies of sounds decaying over time, um, as well as other filters. Reaper, Reaper's um, plugin has a low pass and a high pass control down here, as well as some sort of control over stereo effects, uh, some sort of control over the way different signals go to the left and right um, channels of our output. We see that Reaper's reverb 8 has a stereo width um, plug, um, parameter to control here. So quite a few variables um, to control here. Um, if we count what's on Re Reaper's plugin, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight distinct parameters, um, and the manipulation of any of those parameters will give us some, some definitely some, some audibly different results. So we're going to move now to the second major way in which reverb is simulated with software nowadays. And this is called convolution or convolution reverb. And um, we're going to get to explaining how convolution reverb works in a series of steps. So let's start by considering the definition of an impulse. An impulse is uh, a signal or a moment in a signal where we go from nothing to something um, right away. And we could approximate an impulse in the acoustics of the real world by making a spark plug fire, um, or maybe even um, more roughly approximate it with something like popping a balloon, or, or I suppose even clapping our hands. Anyway, so an impulse is like a single spike of energy that happens at a certain point in time. So if we make an impulse in a room with a spark plug or a balloon or by clapping, and somewhere else in that room we have a listener, we know from other things that we've seen about how the acoustics of room work, rooms work that at a certain time later we're going to get a uh, slightly reduced, slightly delayed direct wave that reflects that impulse. And that sometime after that, shortly after that, we're going to start to get various early reflections of that wave. And that sometime after that, that microphone or listener is going to get some even smaller and more densely packed late reflections of that impulse. So if we make an impulse and then we record what a microphone hears in a space in response to that impulse, what we would have might be something that would look a little bit like this. And we could call that an impulse response. And it would be a, a kind of measurement of the way that reverberation works in that particular room, in that particular arrangement of source and listener. So kind of file that in the back of your mind that we could make these impulse responses. Now, the 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 key thing then to understanding how this lets us simulate reverb is to realize that in a digital audio signal, such as the signal we have in a digital audio file that we've recorded, each individual sample in the file is like an impulse, but with a different size and, if you like, direction. Like some impulses go up and some impulses go down. So what we could do with the impulse response is we could take every sample of, of some kind of arbitrary signal that we have, like a sound that we want to add reverb to, 
and we could apply the impulse response accordingly. For example, if we had an input sample, an input impulse that was relatively tiny, we could extend out from that a copy of the impulse response that was also similarly tiny, so it would kind of decay away. Um, but its overall size would be determined by how big that small impulse the small impulse was. And let's say that we had at another moment we have a, a sample in our input sound that is it's quite large and it goes downwards. Well perhaps that becomes a quite large and flipped upside down version of the impulse response. And so we could do that for every sample in our file. We could mix together all of those impulse responses. And when we do that, what we're doing is called convolution. And what we would get is essentially a simulation of a very precise simulation of what you would get if you had made that sound at the location where the impulse happened in the room where you recorded the impulse response. So let's us simulate that physical situation quite exactly and precisely. So Reaper has a plugin for convolution reverb as well, and this is its reverb plugin, Reaper's convolution plugin, and it looks somewhat different um, than the Schroeder reverberator that we saw earlier. Um, and it's got this interface in the middle where you can click Add and then pick File, and you can direct it to an audio file which it loads and which it interprets as an impulse response. And I've loaded one of those impulse responses here before taking this screenshot, and we can we can kind of guess that it's an impulse response because we see it has this um, this characteristic shape of being kind of dense and high at the beginning and then quickly um, decaying away to nothing. So convolution reverb uses impulse responses to create a precise simulation of a specific source, space, and listener relationship. And the kind of neat thing about this is that these impulse responses, we can record them ourselves and share them online with other people. We can find the impulse responses that other people can make. Um, for some time in the late 1990s, in the heyday of the domestic internet, I had found uh, a site where they were someone was freely sharing impulse responses that they had recorded or collected from around the world. And there was a particular subway station in, in Sweden that I used as a reverberation in lots of pieces through the magic of convolution reverb. And I, I had never been to that subway station or I'd never been to Sweden, um, but I was able to simulate sounds being in that space using convolution reverb. Quite fun. Um, the main parameters of convolution reverb are typically somewhat more limited than the Schroeder reverb. We'll have our choice of impulse response, um, that, that file, like my file for the Swedish um, subway station, and then we'll be able to control the wet versus dry levels, and often there isn't much more beyond that. So the Schroeder reverberator typically has more parameters to control, um, so more flexibility in that sense, um, but, but usually less realism. Um, we can sometimes transform the impulse responses that we use with convolution reverb, but this is still going to be somewhat less fluid and flexible than just changing the parameters of a Schroeder reverb. And the final thing that I want to say about convolution reverb um, to encourage experimentation is that we can creatively misuse Schroeder reverberation. Uh, sorry, we can creatively misuse convolution reverb. Instead of using a proper impulse response, one of those things that was recorded by making a making an impulse in a space and then seeing what you get, we could actually use any sound as an impulse. Um, and when we do that, what we'll get is um, we'll get strange sounds often, and what they will be is a kind of product of whatever frequencies were in both recordings. In other words, the impulse response and the input sound. Um, so a lot of fun uh, experimenting with those creative possibilities. So to summarize this module, um, we looked at some of the early ways that reverb um, was simulated, such as bathroom reverberation and spring and plate reverberation. Uh, and then we looked at the two most common ways that reverb is simulated in software, Schroeder reverberation and convolution reverb. Um, both have their applications and utility. Um, they are, however, um, distinct. And knowing which one to use when or having a sense of which one we might prefer to use when uh, is a key um, contemporary audio skill.